All right, hello, how are you? Here we are starting with Wisdom is Bliss on page 17 and the middle of the page, the highway with eight lanes, talking about the noble, friendly, eightfold path. And um, I realized uh, I only got started in this chapter of realistic worldview uh, because I had a long preamble about the whole project. But maybe that was worthwhile. I hope so. I think there were some useful things there that were worth your listening and worth my saying. But now I want to move ahead in the book uh, to get on with the right view, right view. Okay, the eight lanes of this highway usually have been referred to in English as the lanes of right view, right motivation or purpose, right speech, right evolutionary action, or you, they use the right action simply, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, which is, means med meditation, you could say meditation, but they choose the meditation word samadhi, which particularly means concentration in this case. So uh, they, that's what they do. Translating the Sanskrit samyak, as the right in right view, reflects the idea of the early English translators that Buddhism must be a religion and the, the lanes of its highway must be a set of religious rules or commandments against which one's actions can be measured as right and wrong. Because right and wrong means following a rule rightly or wrongly. That is what they expected of a religion. So that's why they also were into translating satya as truth because they were thinking you're supposed to believe in the Four Noble Truths, but you're not. The Four Noble Truths, the Four Friendly Fun Facts, you're supposed to, first one, you're supposed to acknowledge it, notice it, that's notice your symptom. Second one, you're supposed to investigate the causation, not just believe, investigate it. Third one, you're supposed to feel encouragement about it, imagine it, and try to realize it. Fourth, try to reach that prognosis and, and imagine it to encourage yourself that you can. And fourth one, you're meant to study, practice, travel it. It's a path. So belief is not the thing, and the worldview is not. It could, right view could be called right belief. But in a way, it's not to be believed. It's you have to unbelieve all kinds of wrong beliefs and become open to reality is really what it is rather than whole accept, you must at least accept causation. If you can't be a little bit responsible for causation, then you will be really frozen in trying to travel the path. You know, you're very, very, if you, it's almost like psychotic not to think causation happens. <laughs> so there, there, that's a pragmatic, you could say that's a pragmatic belief. Okay, so translating it that way, so that is what they expected of a religion, that it should have a creed, a set of beliefs, and rules of thought and behavior as prescribed by a deity or a prophet, like their own Western religions. But the Buddha was not founding a new religion. He was rebelling, in fact, against the Vedas religion of his culture, rejecting its inadequacy, although he knew it very well. When his father sends people to try to dissuade him, from following his path of seeking enlightenment after he renounces being a prince and renounces his identity and renounces his class and et cetera, et cetera, uh, even his name. The father keeps sending him people who keep using things from the Vedic culture to say you should be a good boy, you should do what your dad wants, you have, to, you have the responsibility to be a king, you don't have to worry about the people, the gods are taking care of them and life and so on, blah, blah. And he would use knowledge of Vedic lore, Vedic lore, and uh, their myths and legends and wise teachings, many. And he would use that to reject their arguments and say, well, yes, it's good to be a son and good to be obedient, et cetera, but more important is to help people, and even your father to help, even, even if he isn't the way he asks you to help him, and so on. So he, and he, he backs himself up with the Vedic thing because it was a very developed and sophisticated civilization that he would chose to be born in. But he rejected it, he, he rejected it, uh, he 
rebelled against the Vedic religion of his culture and rejected its adequacy. Oh my, I said typo, a, a mistake. <laughs> Where's my pen? <laughs> rejected its adequacy. He didn't reject its inadequacy. He rejected for its inadequacy. The editing here, I blew this, and they blew it. Rejected its adequacy. Rejected its adequacy for guiding and fulfilling human life. In other words, it had some usefulness, but it was inadequate, mainly because, as he told his father, when his father said, oh, you can't, you don't need to get enlightened. The gods are taking care of people and they're suffering. You can't, you can't do anything about that. You just do defense, health, education, and welfare. You're the king, you know, and you set a good example for the people and so on. And you uphold the law and so on. And he said, but you don't worry about the quality of life because that's what the priests take care of and the gods. And then Buddha said, well, the gods are doing a lousy job. And I think I can do better. He did, he did say that. So he rejected its adequacy. And actually his theory of karma, his theory of causation, again, precisely, of, of happiness and suffering, uh, was the first biological theory, like a Darwinian theory. It wasn't the gods causing it. It was a, cause, a causal process of evolution that was causing the quality of life to be the way it was. Really amazing what he did. But anyway, rejecting its adequacy, not rejecting its inadequacy, <laughs> for guiding and fulfilling human life. Instead of enforcing a religion, he was instituting a new system of liberating education. Absolutely. Instead of saying right, therefore, I use the term realistic for the Sanskrit, samyak. And actually, sam means together. It's a prefix in Sanskrit. And yak means going. It's related to a verb ya, which means to go, which is a motion word. So samyak means all together going, going all together. So that's why it means something positive. So then they said, right. So samyak view is a view that goes all together. So it works. You know, there's a, work, a view that works out with all in the context, sam, all together with everything. So that's, in that sense, something good. But it doesn't have to be right. Uh, mitya is, means it misleads. It takes you in the wrong way. And so that can be wrong. That's fine. So if it's right and wrong, it's not bad. It's, it's, it's OK. But it puts it in this wrong context as if it is just rule following, which would be for, fit for religion. But it isn't that. So therefore, it's realistic and unrealistic. Because reality is good. So when you do something that accords with the good reality, it's realistic. You're moving toward reality. That's, that's how it should be translated. I'm sure, actually, I didn't invent that. A bright former student of mine who was always smart, I'm sure he was smarter than me, so he had trouble studying with me. <laughs> and now he's a great teacher, very bright one. He used realistic at one point in his writings, and then he rejected and went back to right and wrong because he didn't really think of how it came to him intuitively, unfortunately, or he would have kept it. And then maybe he'll go back to it when, he, when I can argue with him in the future. Rejecting its adequacy for guiding and fulfilling human life. Instead of enforcing religion, he was instituting a new system of liberating culture. So I touch each of the eight things. I'm realistic is better for according with reality, is what realistic means, rather than right, which is appropriate for following a rule, right or wrong. And reality is where the highway leads. It is what the highway is and where it leads. It is what we have to work with. Of course, in matters of practicality, being realistic is right and being unrealistic is wrong. So it's not that far off. So I'm not really challenging the 19th century British Englishman who went right and wrong about it. You may also have heard that Buddhism, quote unquote, is basically or even only meditation. And that, me and that meditation is the most important thing you can do. And learning, quote unquote, is okay, but not so important. Therefore, for they, when, when the Sanskrit has learning, shiksha, they always say training. <laughs> so the same people and translators, they would say, I'm training, we're training. Because they, why? That's Western arrogance. They, they all went to college, they went to graduate school, they went to high school. They think they already learned everything worth learning. 
So that didn't help them, and they're still miserable, so they didn't think it helped them. But they, maybe they can be trained to meditate, you know, like a dog or a horse or something, they can be trained. But, that, but that's, uh, training is part of learning, of course. But learning it means you actually have to critique your own stupid ideas. And, and, and learn something new. And then if the new thing really begins to work better, then you can train in making it deeper in your knowledge. So that's fine. But training only and no learning, that's typical of the meditation sellers, salesmen and women. Okay? So that meditation is the most important thing you can do. And learning is okay, but not so important. That's what they say. Practice, we are told, is meditation, and that's it. The rest is window dressing. This is misleading, both wrong and unrealistic. The Buddha makes this very clear by placing the realistic view, samyaka dhrsti, yandak vitawa in Tibetan, samyaka ditti, sama, sama ditti. I don't think they go with samyak, they go sama, sama ditti in Pali, as the, the very first lane of the Eightfold Highway. Why is it meditation first? Where is meditation? Well, one kind of meditation is the last, the eighth branch, realistic concentration, samyak samadhi. And maybe another type is an aspect of the second, seventh branch, realistic remembering or mindfulness, samyak smriti. When I was just getting started on this highway or path in my own early understanding, I wanted only to meditate. Whereas I was misled by this idea while reading, and not, but then once I started studying, my wonderful teacher, Dunji Led I mentioned his name for a purpose, the Venerable Geshe Wangyal, the late Venerable Geshe Wangyal, uh, he read to me in Tibetan uh, the translation of the uh, Nagarjuna's book called The Friendly Letter, which was Nagarjuna's letter to a king about how to live and how to rule. And it had a commentary by a Tibetan that was translated from Sanskrit, uh, but it had a commentary written in, in native Tibetan by a great master in the 14th century called Rendawa. And uh, while reading Nagarjuna's book and Rendawa's book, the Tibetan language shone off the page to me in letters of gold. And I wanted to leap toward freedom from habitual reality. Subliminally, I think I may have wanted freedom from life. <laughs> I was an anxious 21-year-old. I would get so filled with this feeling of nirvana presence, freedom from my worries, freedom from all anxieties and fears, that I would go into a kind of trance-like meditation quite easily. And I would actually begin to experience leaving my body, feeling as if I was on the threshold of melting into nirvana as I imagined it. Geshe La, my beloved root teacher, went to some trouble to actually stop me from meditating. I couldn't believe it at the time, since I thought that meditation was the way out of my predicament in the world. He was definitely clairvoyant, I'm sure now, or I became sure quite soon, since whenever I jumped into meditation anyway, even though I was recommended not to do it before learning, and especially when I began to leave the plane of the anxious mind in the restless body and soar into contemplative spaces of release and ease, he would show up, bang on my door if I was in my room, interrupt me, distract me, and take me back to the path of learning and thinking. If it, if it involved taking me back to the kitchen to have yogurt, in the middle of the night he would do that, away from my medit meditating in bed in my room. Although I would be polite, I would think, oh, I can get back to nirvana-ish meditation states later. That's where it is. And then I would deal with him because I was very grateful for his teaching, of course, but I was irritated with him interrupting me. And a couple of times I almost did, but my meditation obsession was so frustrated by him and I was so confused about it and so annoyed. Actually. Much later, after learning more and more and using meditation more carefully, I overcame my frustration and realized that this was a great blessing, a deep teaching. There is no use in meditating much until you have learned something and become clear, especially about the way you deeply and unconsciously exaggerate your sense of self. Before you disrupt that habit, 
heightened meditative prowess will just give more power and armor to that deep-seated self-identity habit. This habit is the seemingly natural feeling of being an absolute, fixed, solid, undeniably present, really real self. The mind is so powerful, if you meditate too much without learning to somewhat neutralize that habit, you can get stuck in some sort of dissociative state. Sorry, folks, but that is a fact. As, as actually the Tibetan doctor, Dr. Nita, my, my buddy, when we were at Budapest, LA, a couple of years ago, he warmed my heart, truly speaking, when it was his turn to talk. I had sort of introduced him to them and brought him to do it. And I told him it would be really good for them as a Tibetan physician and also a teacher of Dzogchen, which is one of their favorite kinds of meditating, because he had a spiritual teacher side as well as a physician side. The best kind of spiritual teacher is a kind of physician, actually, really. So they are really sensitive to what people, what's wrong with people, you know, and not push them beyond their capacities and so on. It's very, very important. So he's a wonderful teacher. But anyway, what he first said right at the beginning was, he said, you know, he said, it's not only, no, he said, let me get in the right order. He said, meditation can also have harmful side effects. It's not only medication that does, he said. <laughs> he said, the immortal statement, and it's greeted by the Zenis and the Vipassanites with great shock. Like, how can he be saying this? A Tibetan guru type, and even a doctor, meditation, which is the one soul good that we're delivering to the masses. You know? I mean, really, meditation can have unpleasant, harmful side effects, not only medication. I know it really. Uh, the, but that's, that would be a dissociative state. That would be a way of becoming just a trance, entranced in something and therefore unable to critically think through your stupid ideas that are foisted upon you by the materialistic, slightly insane culture that we live in, of a world that is destroying itself. It's proven insanity, the culture, because the society as a whole is destroying itself. Okay, which means everybody in it gets destroyed, even the rich, they get destroyed. There's no, because there's no other place to have a society than the planet Earth. They can look at Mars and they can watch the avatar about going to the moon of Jupiter, but they won't be getting there in the whole way. Not, not, by, you know, not by driving a Ford or General Motors. No way. Or even a Tesla. Much later, after yeah, I overcame it, a deep teaching, yes, yes. The Buddha's great discovery came from his sustained investigation of the status of his sense of absolute intrinsic self-identity, which he spent six years looking for within himself. Eventually, he experienced that sense as, base, as baseless, its assumed object, his intrinsic identity, dissolving under analysis. A little scary at first, but then immensely releasing. The hard part of his liberating discovery was his experience of his habitual self seeming to disappear into a yawning nothingness. And the amazingly gracious and blissful part was the realization that his relational, resilient, living self was infinitely, blissfully, triumphantly, and responsibly better off without being trapped and subjugated by a false sense of domination, by a seemingly fixed and tyrannical self-identity. Good paragraph, Bob. <laughs> and my editors. Very good. So this thing about the nothingness, that's important because there is, the, there is an experience of nothingness. And when we are thinking that everything that we experience is, has intrinsic reality in itself, 
Like that really is really the floor. It's intrinsically the floor. It's the floor out of its own floorness. It's not the floor because it's a relational use of atoms which have grown into a tree and made cells in a, in a plant and then been sawed up and by humans and then hammered together and blah, 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 and taken to the sawmill and dried and you know, the whole process. And, and really atoms are in there and then they don't even know what the atoms are really. So it's actually a mystery what the floor is. Instead of that, we think it's really there. So then when we are letting go of everything, one of our, the, you could almost say the final experience before hitting a kind of enlightenment, before finding within a kind of enlightenment, is an experience as if everything will be nothing. And it's almost like everything is nothing. It's like a kind of conscious unconsciousness. It's like, it's where our, you know, when we fall asleep, we, of course, so every night we let go of everything. In a sense, we die. Our waking self dies every night. And we're so tired, we don't mind. And we just let go and conk, we conk out. So in a way, we have that experience of nothingness every time we do that. But we don't think we have it as an experience. We just think it's the end of our waking experience. So we don't have the experience of being unconscious in a sense. The being unconscious doesn't become an object. It can be an objective if we're an insomniac, <laughs> because we want to be unconscious. But it's not an object because we just lose consciousness. But when you're a meditator and you're going more deeply into the subtle areas of your mind, then you come up upon the threshold of losing consciousness of giving up consciousness, of giving up a sense of controlling you, yourself and what's around you. And you see it like an object that seems to, that you seem to be falling into, like a space you seem to be going into. And I guess maybe some people, if they're sensitive when they fall asleep, they will feel like they go into a dark, a restful place or something, because they want to go there. And uh, so they, that's, they welcome that kind of death of awareness. So, however, when you're meditating, when you, for the first time you hit that, hit that feeling of nothingness, that wall of nothingness, which seems like an object to you at that time, unlike when you normally fall asleep, where you just kind of let go, but it seems like a wall. And then the question of letting go into it becomes like scary. And you're, for, well, if, I'm, if, if I become this nothingness, then I won't even know who I am. I'll forget that I want to be enlightened. I'll forget that I'm human. I'll forget everything and blah, blah, blah. And you get very, very scared. And it's like, almost like fear of death. And you think maybe it is dying. Maybe this is stupid, all this stuff I've been doing and learning and meditating. Maybe I'm just killing myself. And you actually feel that. And it's so interesting. The one way to really save yourself from the existential fear of death there well, like maybe there are two ways. Although, no, because the existentialist doesn't have that meditative thing. They're not going up through all kinds of realms and spaces, usually. But, because the, the existentialist sort of like greets the nothingness like you fall asleep. So they, again, in a way, they kind of don't see it as an object they fall into. They like, it's like, I always think of existentialism like the movie Piero Le Fou, the ma ma Piero the Madman. It was like a gangster movie made by Jean Paul somebody, and, uh, or Jean Jacques somebody, where at the end he has sticks of dynamite coiled around his head, and he's smoking a cigar, and then he lights the fuse, and then the screen goes white. So it's like, it's like falling asleep for the existential. So they, maybe they, they think it's a brave thing, and it's wonderful. But even the fact that they say it takes bravery, it takes philosophical courage to embrace nothingness means they were a little bit aware of that, that, that objective relationship. But the meditative one is very, very powerful because it really seems to be a space you go to. So the, since you don't ever disappear forever, since it's impossible to do, because there is no nothing, because nothing doesn't have an object, the knowing of that is what saves you from the fear and what allows you to let go in that meditative plane, apparently. Well, it helped me anyway. I don't know how deeply I really did it. But, that, but that's the, what they call Akim Janiyatana. It's one of the four formless realms. And another kind of thing could happen to a being in there that Buddha warned about, and that the danger of meditating is that someone who was very self, 
deprecative, didn't like themselves, wanted to leave the world in any way whatsoever, would happily be nothing. That person then thinks, oh, this is a divine state, I want to stay here. And they go in and they become, they can become a deity of the formless realm according to Buddhist meditational psychological phenomenology. And that's a terrible fate, actually, although it feels like a relief when it happens, just like falling asleep. But it is a bad fate because then you spend a long period of time, I mean, cosmologically long, maybe length of the duration of the planet, a billion years, something. there's no sense of time at all in it. But it just ends up being a long time, they say. And you become really dull. Your intelligence and critical perception becomes really dulled because you feel you have no body. And then when the momentum that brought you there, the evolutionary momentum that brought you into seeking such states and then mistaking this state for the absolute and, and seeking to remain in it, then you fall into the realm of reincarnated stupidity, which is the animal realm, subhuman animal realm, bestial realm, and it takes a long time to work your way back up to being human from there. So it's a very, uh, not a good state to have achieved, actually. Although it's a yogic achievement to, to, know, to, to visit the state in the sense of meditatively reach there, that's considered a, a great ability and gives you a great ability of concentration to go through that, even to a state beyond that that is almost like a clear light state, but yet you're still isolated in that state where you, you can also still have the danger of getting stuck in the state of its supreme concentration. If you haven't gotten the realistic worldview and realized what's called the royal reason of relativity and are, and are, and are having a complete embodiment of causation and relationality, that's what immunizes you. You can go to those states safely in meditation. You're immunized to being stuck in any one of them because you realize that anything that you experience, even if it seems like an absolute thing, and you leave your body to be absolute, that that's your construction, because you are mentally projecting that, and you're making it seem like a solid thing out there that you, where you can go and merge yourself and give yourself up to it. And that's what blocks you from giving yourself up, period, within relativity. <laughs> But it, so that's the danger of it. I think I never explained it quite that well before. That's good. And we come back to it in a later chapter. Okay, his revolutionary discovery gave birth to the first of the eight lanes of the highway, the realistic worldview. It is just exactly this deep, visceral, relational, intuitive awareness of freedom, a response of freedom that automatically expands awareness of every detail of the field of cause and effect within which, within which one is free to make the most realistic choices. This realistic worldview is what Buddhist science most importantly brings to the West and serves as the basis of any useful meditation. Thus, the realistic worldview initially has to do with learning, science, intellect, and wisdom, and ultimately deploys meditation to permeate all one's emotional and even instinctual being with that wisdom. So that's when meditation, when you have realistic worldview, uh, and you have it inferentially, critically, in, with, uh, with critical wisdom, where you, you, it's a rational understanding that becomes very, very strong, just like when you see smoke, you know there's a fire, and you'll go in that direction to find the fire when you just see smoke rising over treetops. So its inference is not nothing. Conceptuality is useful within the world constructed by conceptuality, for sure. And we need realistic conceptuality to get out of unrealistic conceptualities. And the realistic conceptuality of realistic worldview is embodying causation and embodying relativity and realizing that anything that we as relational living beings can experience is relational. So even whenever we encounter something that seems like what we might imagine to be the absolute, 
like we have very naive notions of I it. Mean, people talk about God as the absolute, which means that means the opposite. The, I mean, intelligent theologians, you know, say, talk about it, which means the absolute God, and yet God creates the world without relating to it. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. Then the absolute doesn't mean anything, and rela relational doesn't mean anything. If absolute is the opposite of relation, then anything absolute is irrelevant to the relative people. Unless it's all of the whole field of relativity in some inconceivable way, which we'll come to. So don't know you don't overdo. Don't accept that as a dogma. But I'm saying on some level you can see that. To be absolute means it has to not be in solution with anything. It's away from ab means away from ablative, you know, away from solution. So it can't be touched by anything and therefore can't touch anything. Therefore can't, if God creates, if a God creates a world, it's rela he relating to the he or she or it is relating to that world. Okay? That's obvious by the meaning of the word. So a response, this revolutionary discovery gave birth to the first of the eight lanes of the highway, the realistic worldview. It is just exactly this deep, visceral, relational, intuitive awareness of freedom within relationship, a responsive freedom that automatically expands awareness of every detail of the field of cause and effect within which one is always free to make the most realistic choices. This realistic worldview is what Buddhist science most importantly brings to the West and serves as the basis of any useful meditation. Thus, the realistic worldview initially has to do with learning science, intellect, and wisdom, and, and, and then eventually deploys meditation to permeate all one's emotional and even instinctual being. Once such a worldview becomes clear, then meditation becomes realistic. In fact, meditation at that point is totally necessary to deepen our understanding and open us up to the miracles of relativity, thereby empowering our compassionate activity. That is why Buddha insisted that the first line on the highway, lane, I'm sorry, the first lane on the highway invites our learning and understanding. And that learning means understanding relationships, not only relationships in the sense of life partners or parents or children, but relationships within the realities of all that is. This is really the main mantra of Buddha's teaching. It's epitome Try not to worry about it being in Sanskrit. It's a powerful mantra. And then I repeat this one. I repeat it to my friend Peter. Om ye dharma hetu brabhavaha hetun tisham tatagata hi avadat tisham chayo nirodho ivam vadi mahasramaniye swaha. Om of all things created from causes, the realized Lord declares their causes and their cessation. Just this he proclaimed. All hail to him, the great transcender. Thus, the realistic worldview is, and actually, Tathagata, this, this word Tathagata, and maybe I will come back and start with that in the next one. Tathagata means one who has gone to the suchness of things. Suchness of things means that things that you see that seem to be like this, they're such as what they are, but that means they're not only what they seem to be. They're just such as what they seem to be. You follow me? Suchness is where you see everything like that. So that means you see the illusoriness of things in that they present themselves in a way that it's not really what they are. They're, it's just as such as what they are, if you follow me. Suchness, it's a very interesting concept. Sort of like isness that Western mystics talked about. A little bit like thatness, which Buddhist talks about, but suchness is more subtle. It shows it, it's a it's a kind of an awareness that everything that you see, when you see it as such as it is, it means that it's elusive. It eludes your feeling that it is exactly what it is. In other words, it's only such as what it is. It's like what it is. It's a it's a simil similitude of what it is. So that means it's not quite only just what it is. So that means it could be clear light, ultimately. What it seems to be solid wood, apart from clear light, from the deep, deep energy of the deepest energy of the universe, whereas it is the deep energy of the universe in this particular formulation.
Thus, the realistic worldview is the rational acceptance of causation and its transcendence, not blind faith in some authority or guru. It is not even any compulsory belief in the Buddhist three jewel refuges. The Buddha as the example and the teacher, the Dharma as the teachings and the reality taught, and the Sangha as a community of fellow students. It is not even blind faith in nirvanic freedom. Cause and effect are eminently plain to see, which reasonably leads to the Buddhist understanding that there is no single mysterious cause for things, but rather numerous causal conditions which yet allow transcendent freedom. This is all a part, in, but the transcendent freedom is freedom from something. So it's even that transcendent freedom, although it's transcendent, it's still transcending something. It's free from something. So it's freedom in relation to something. This is all a part of the realistic worldview that we can test and, if it meshes with our experience, adopt. The first step toward a realistic worldview is one taken to accept the reality of causation. Understanding cause and effect as both relative and temporally infinite, ultimately beginningless and endless, we then can confront the causal world more creatively, knowing we are both part of it and potentially all of it. We can, in other words, we can feel we about all of it. We can feel I about all of it. We can identify with the tree. We can be the tree. We can identify with the building. We can be the building. We can identify with any number of other persons or any one other person and be that person. We can identify with all the other beings and be all of them. In fact, we are given infinite time, which is different from eternity, I think. Eternity means outside of time. Whereas what would Buddhists are talking is infinity of time that is endless and beginningless. So you can be in all the time, but you're in, there's no place outside of it in that sense. You can be infinite in space, but there's no place outside of infinity. <laughs> it's, infinity it's not limited to oneness, actually. One, one is only relative to two or to none. Right? The first step toward a realistic worldview is one taken to accept the reality of causation. Understanding cause and effect as both relative and temporally infinite, ultimately beginningless and endless, we then can confront the causal world more creatively, knowing we are both part of it and potentially all of it, which in a way is out of being exclusively imprisoned in any one part of it, but not out of all of it. We can face because Never mind. We can face its immensity and dedicate our potential infinite energy toward making the world ever better for everyone. Thus, facing and embracing the timeless infinity of interdependent causation gives us the strength in every finite seeming time to learn to cope with reality cheerfully. We can voluntarily engage with it out of an amazing combination of freedom determined by wisdom and necessity met blissfully with compassion. These are very strong mouthfuls. We could go back over any one of these sentences and run whole numbers all around them. And we can read them again and again and sort of take them deeper. And we, you know what the way that you do in in the tradition is you memorize. Part of learning is memorizing them. And especially when we come to very what are called turning phrases, you know, like sort of like Zen koans, things that could be very clear, but also then you could puzzle infinitely about them and go deeper and deeper. And then those are memorized. And then therefore, when one has lost normal discursivity, in sort of intensified meditative states. These memorized things will come up and they will catapult us into deeper trans-conceptual realizations. They take us to the edge, if you will, the razor's edge of dealing with ambiguity, 
like, right, like, like tightrope walking. When you walk a tightrope, they carry a big pole with weights on both sides that are very widely out there. They're standing on a very narrow thing like a rope. But somehow the, way, the width of those ambiguity of the pole, if they could fall this way or that way, stabilizes them on the, on the line, thin line. So similarly, the intellect, it, when cultivated through learning in this way, by this m magnificent central, central way tradition, the Madhyamaka tradition, uh, from Nagarjuna and from Buddha and the Prajnaparamita, the Transcendent Wisdom Sutras, then uh, the, the, the weights are the ambiguities that one perceives, the paradoxes that one, one perceives holding both sides. Amazing. I'm a New Yorker, and once I had an epiphany in the subway that left a lasting impression. No, I don't think I want to go. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to shorten this one. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop with this one. I'm going to just read this paragraph one more time. I'm not sure I like all of it. I think I do, but I'm not sure it completely holds, holds up. The first step toward a realistic worldview is one taken to accept the reality of causation. Okay. So that's ye dharma hitu prabhava hitu ntisham tatakata hi avadat tisham chayo nirado is the second step. So, you know, that's right. We, I, I mentioned that before, so you got that. If you feel there's some part of you that's beyond causation, then you're psychotic. Then you're detached. Then you're disconnected from reality. Then you can't feel. Then you can't really connect. You can't relate. And that's a, oh, that is really, that's a deep level of disease. And however, and it, can be, it has to be cured by, by developing understanding. It's a deep, deep misunderstanding. It isn't like a, like a material thing, like somebody's then finished and they're tossed out the window. Even, even a psychotic can be reasoned with, can be reached, definitely. The first step, understanding cause and effect as both relative and temporally infinite, ultimately beginningless and endless. Okay, so that's, we, we are, everything, there's cause and effect, and it's relative, and then temporally infinite, then there's this invisible infinity of time, of an infinite past and infinite future. So this relationality within it, infinite is a negation, right? So, it's not necessary that I just did it in time. You know, we have now space-time, you know, since the wonderful relativity theory of Einstein. And we think of time, time as a fourth dimension. So we talk of, we think there can be an invisible dimension that still has bearing on, on us in any moment. So therefore, we call it space-time. So actually, as both relative and both spatially and temporally infinite. I think I would rather, I should rather have put spatially as well as temporary. I use infinite with time, I think, here, because when you say eternal, I think I intuitively was thinking, people just think of sort of like a formless state, like you just leave time. But actually, it's that you go, the way you leave it is by negating finitude in time. And you leave, in a way, you leave space as if it were a place that you could go into in, in a pure form where you would, there wouldn't be anything in the space, but you'd be the space, which is a state that you can experience, but very clearly must be clear not to be stuck in it. So it should be spatially and temporally infinite, I think I would prefer. Ultimately beginning and endless, and of course, spatially infinite. I think really I should have put that here. We then can confront the causal world more creatively, knowing we are both part of it and potentially all of it. So to be potentially all of it means all of it in space as well as time. We can trace its immensity and dedicate our potential infinite energy toward making the world ever better for everyone. And of course, and the world is in space as well as time. That's what I didn't like when I, something jarred me in reading it. And it's because I focused particularly on the time. And maybe because I was trying to set up some, some reasoning in regard to time. And also because time is something kind of invisible to us. 
and it's very powerful over us, but it's invisible to us. And so I wanted to particularly point that out. We get away from this idea of a first beginning or a final ending. Knowing we are, when infinite is itself spatial. We think infinite as unlimited as spatial. Then we say eternal, we think infinite and eternal. But eternal is not like infinite. Non-temporal would be more like infinite. Non-temporal and infinite. Not eternal. Because eternal, we immediately will take an invisible thing and then reify it into some sort of notion that there's no, of a disconnectedness from relationality, a disconnected place or something in time. And we shouldn't do that. And when we do it intellectually, it doesn't much matter even, of course, it's just intellectual imprecision. But when we're meditatively up there, then that's, that's not good. That becomes nihilistic. We can face its immensity and its non-temporality or intemporality. You know, can't say that. Immensity, immeasurability in space and time, spatio-temporal immensity, and dedicate our potential infinite energy toward making the world ever better for everyone. Thus facing and embracing the timeless infinity. Okay, I'm again, there again, I'm using timeless, that's like eternal. But, so uh, the, the non-temporal infinity, or the all to omnitemporal infinity. Embracing the omnitemporal infinity, that would be good, of interdependent causation, gives us the strength in every finite seeming time to learn to cope with reality cheerfully. We can voluntarily engage with it out of an amazing combination of freedom determined by wisdom and necessity met blissfully with compassion. Okay, I'm stopping here. I dedicate the merit of our struggle on this, our, my editorial discovery as well. I'm, I'm using this to improve and uh, I dedicate it to quickly becoming infinite in space and time as a Buddha, to help everybody else to become infinite in space and time as a Buddha, in infinite temporally and spatially bound bodies, which we will need at that time to interact with all beings and bring them to be just equal to us, so we'll all be Buddhas together.